What you are watching right now is a scene from Walt Disney's seminal 1942 animated feature film, Bambi. It is one of the most famous scenes in animated film history, or even just film history in general. The scene that traumatized a generation of boomers who would then go on to mercilessly parody it decades later. Pet, I'd like to buy a vowel. But what actually makes the scene so effective, so memorable? For the first third of the movie, there are almost two main characters, Bambi and Bambi's mother. The first act revolves around the naive fawn learning about the world surrounding him, learning how to walk, talk, make friends, and play, all while his mother is nearby acting not only as a nurturing parental figure, but also Bambi's teacher and protector. She is the one who teaches Bambi about the woods and how to navigate them safely, and whenever Bambi finds himself scared or separated, he always finds himself back in the warm embrace of his mother. That is, until an outing to find food in the middle of winter finds the two of them in the crosshairs of man. Bambi's mother can only tell him to run back to the safety of their den, her voice getting louder and more frantic as the young deer obeys his mother like he always has. And then, a gunshot rings out. Bambi at first thinks he and his mother got away safely. We made it! We made it, mother! But his mother is not there anymore. As he wanders the dark snow-covered forest calling out for his mother, there is no answer. His voice growing more anxious and tearful as each cry is met with more silence. It isn't until he comes face to face with the great prince of the forest, his father, who tells him the hard truth. Your mother can't be with you anymore. We never see Bambi's mother get shot. We never see her body. We don't even hear the words, she's dead. But it's enough to show the audience that, from this point forward, Bambi will have to now continue his life without his mother's presence. It's a great scene. Too great almost. Probably to the film's detriment. In popular culture, Bambi occupies the same space as Full Metal Jacket where people are intimately familiar with only half of it thanks to both movies having strong first acts with earth-shattering emotional climaxes. The death of Bambi's mother is so potent as a first act closer that lets people talk about the second act of a full-grown Bambi falling in love with childhood friend Faline and fighting rival Steg Rondo over her, and even less talk about the climactic third act where Bambi successfully defends the forest from man's dogs and fire and rightfully takes his place as Prince of the Forest. Us millennials were similarly traumatized over Mufasa's death in The Lion King, but we still remembered Hakuna Matata came shortly afterwards. Hakuna Matata! But it's still an important scene within the context of the story. It is the end of childhood for Bambi. Well, unless you count the midquel that came out in the aughts, and now he has to grow up and move forward without his mother by his side. But what if he had never gotten over his mother's death? What if it ate away at his soul constantly? What if his father had never been there to pick him up and left Bambi alone to lash out at the unfairness of the world? To dwell on how, even though he did everything his mother told him to do to be safe, it still didn't stop her from being taken away from him. That is the question a film studio from a certain island nation across the Pacific was attempting to answer when they made today's film. The film that took that famous scene from Bambi and built the whole house out of it. Video. 1978's Chirin no Suzu, translated to Chirin's Bell, but known here as Ringing Bell, is one of those anime films that I, as a purveyor of retro animation history, mostly around anime but not always, am sort of destined to do a video on. There's a certain branch of films out there that have their stake in popular culture centered around intrigue, specifically intrigue around the shocking, dark subject matter within. Challenging films that seem to demand analysis from people like me, either to explore their cheerless themes or to hold it up like a barker at a carnival freak show holding up a specimen and saying, oh my god, this movie is fucked up. And within those ranks lies this film. 
this children's film. This children's film produced by the same company that's best known for creating Hello Kitty. People have gone on record in saying that this film is one of the only Japanese shock films marketed to families and children. Yes, put this film in the same category as In the Realm of the Senses, please. I can see why one would draw that conclusion. Ringing Bell is an extremely heavy movie that is made with children and families in mind. And people going into it unprepared are definitely going to be taken off guard by its sudden tonal shift, its darker than usual plot, and the delivery of themes done in a very frank and unsentimental manner. Those elements, however, are just some of the properties that make Ringing Bell still a very moving and effective piece of animated drama. And to just reduce it to this piece of shocking media that you can only talk about with a thumbnail that includes your avatar making a goofy face, that is a complete disservice to the work. And by the way, audience, if you do see me start to do something like that, you have my full permission to track me down and shoot me out in the woods like the dumb, suffering animal I have become. But before we really dig into Ringing Bell and its history, I need to do a brief synopsis of what the film is about. You can already tell by now, right? How cagey I've been with my narration and how selective I've been with the clips I've shown thus far. But once you know everything about this movie, it will make the information that comes afterwards all the sweeter. <laughs> Somewhere deep in the valley's pasture, there is a lamb named Chirin. He frolics and plays just like all the other lambs, with the only difference between them being the ringing bell he wears around his neck. However, he is far more carefree and headstrong than the others, a fact that worries his loving mother. He does, however, obey the most important rule she gives him. <laughs> A rule that ends up being all for naught since, on a dark night, the wolf Wo breaks into the pasture and starts killing the sheep. Chirin almost winds up being one of his many victims, but his mother shields him from Wo's fangs, killing her in the process. Struck with sadness and anger for the first time in his young life, Chirin decides that the best course of action is to leave the pasture and seek out Wo to train him to become a wolf. Otherwise, he would just be a sheep waiting to be eaten. If he was a wolf, he could avoid that fate. At first, Wo brushes him off and Chirin decides to become a wolf on his own, to less than satisfactory results. <laughs> But once he accidentally destroys a mother bird's nest trying to fend off the snake that just killed her, Chirin breaks down and wonders why the weak must die. It is here that Wo imparts a harsh but ultimately necessary lesson to the young lamb. <laughs> With that, Wo agrees to train Chirin, who vows one day to become so strong that he can enact vengeance on Wo. Years of harsh training go by, and Chirin goes from being a young lamb to a lean, mean ram with coarse wool and horns sharp as knives. And by that point, Chirin no longer sees Wo as a target of vengeance, but as his teacher and father figure whom he hunts alongside with. <laughs> One night, Wo tells Chirin that they are going back to the pasture where he grew up and killing every sheep that resides there. By severing that link, Chirin thinks that this will complete his transformation into a wolf. But upon returning, he suddenly finds himself unwilling to kill the sheep. And when Wo decides to finish the job for him, he duels and kills Wo instead. Chirin realizes he's not a wolf but the door for him to go back to being a sheep is quite literally slammed in his face. Wandering back to the mountains alone, Chirin now mourns that killing Wo has also taken away his only companion. Chirin has now become a wolf. A lone wolf. The movie ends with him mournfully screaming out Wo's name. It's sounding like a howl. 
He would then go on to establish himself as the Holy Emperor, and kidnapping scores of children to construct his Holy Cross mausoleum to become the tomb for his deceased master. And oh wait, I am getting this mixed up with another anime, sorry. But yeah, pretty gnarly stuff for a G-rated movie. But you really gotta know something to understand Ringing Bell. This was all intentional. The story of Ringing Bell goes way back to the year 1919, where in Tokyo, Japan, a man named Takeshi Yanase was born. Tracing his roots all the way back to the legendary Taira Samurai clan, Yanase was the son of a journalist for the Shanghai edition of the Japanese Post, and was stationed there. Sadly, his father died unexpectedly when Yanase was five, and his mother had to rely on numerous familial connections for stability. It was during this time that Yanase was taken in by his uncle, who was a devoted hobbyist who encouraged the young boy's creativity. Yanase was also a devoted reader of the first Japanese magazine devoted to young boys, Shonen Club. In 1939, shortly after he graduated art school, Yanisei found himself conscripted by the Japanese army and sent to fight on the Chinese front of World War II. He never saw any action though, as his job was being a codebreaker and drawing propaganda for the local populace as part of pacification efforts. But once the war was inevitably lost on the Japanese side, Yanisei returned home to a post-war life of poverty. Working for a scrap collecting company before transitioning to graphic design for the Mitsukushi department store, Yanase really struggled despite having a job that utilized his artistic talents. It wasn't until 1953 that he switched to becoming a cartoonist for gag manga, since that paid better. Of course, then he ran into another problem since it was the 50s and gag manga was losing ground to more story-based manga being spearheaded by Osamu Tezuka. Still, Yanase carried on until the mid-60s, when, at a manga exhibition, he had a chance encounter with a man named Shintaro Suji. Born in 1927 as the scion of a wealthy family, Suji lived a very comfortable yet very cloistered childhood, which became even less comfortable after his mother died and he was brought under the care of his abusive aunt. After graduating from college with a chemical engineering degree, which successfully allowed him to dodge the draft, Suji made bank taking advantage of the devastated post-war economy by manufacturing goods for the black market, giving him much entrepreneurial experience. Throughout the 50s, Suji worked many jobs, including being a teacher, a commerce worker, and a position in his local prefecture's government, an experience he described as his second adversity after boyhood. With the money he had made in that time period, Suji founded his company, a textile manufacturing company called Yamanashi Silk Center, on August 10th, 1960. By the mid-60s, they were branching out into confectionery packaging, and Suji wanted to give Yanase a job designing characters for said packaging. Yanase enjoyed a permanent position at Suji's company, starting out with confectionery wrappings before moving on to children's book publishing once Suji branched out into that. It was this path that led to the creation that made Yanase Japan's most celebrated children's book author. Beginning as a parody superhero in a 1960s gag manga, Anpan Man is one of Japan's most enduring children's characters. Inspired by Yanase's hunger both during World War II when supply lines were cut short and during his stint of poverty in the post-war era, Anpan Man is an unconventional superhero who helps those in need by fighting against anthropomorphic germs and feeding the starving by giving them parts of his head to eat, his head being a giant Anpan, or red bean pastry. While it was criticized by parent groups and teachers for being too silly when the first book was originally published in 1973, kids couldn't get enough of it. And thanks to publisher Suji's merchandising savvy through his company that he had now rechristened as Sanrio, Anpan Man became one of the biggest merchandise crazes ever. To this day, the Anpan Man franchise has netted $38.4 billion in value and has outgrossed franchises like Harry Potter, Batman, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is all important to know, as Anpan Man's success was one of the factors that made Sanrio the dynamo of a corporation that we know of it today. And by extension, it's also part of the formation of Ringing Bell. See, we haven't forgotten about that yet. Shintaro Suji had really took notice of the power of character-based advertising when he acquired the Japanese licensing rights to Snoopy from Charles Schultz's Peanuts, but he knew he could only go so far with other people's characters. Sanrio would have to create their own to fully reap the benefits. This was what led to Sanrio creating and marketing not just characters like Anpan Man, but also Koro-chan, Little Twin Stars, and the most famous character of them all, 
Hello Kitty. Basuji didn't just see these marketable characters as just commodities, but valuable commodities. He was actually very selective of what merchandise Sanrio's characters would appear on, specifically nothing that would devalue the brand. This included TV anime. While 70s TV anime was shaking some of the medium's growing pains, it still wasn't enough to shake the stigma they had as being nothing more than glorified commercials produced on the fast and the cheap. Anime film, on the other hand, was another story, and if Sanrio was going to have their characters be animated, that was the place Suji wanted them to be. For the time being, of course. This led to the founding of their own animation studio, Sanrio Animation. Sanrio tested the waters by keeping it simple with their first animated film. Released on September 10th, 1977, Sanrio's debut film, Little Jumbo, was a 28-minute operetta about the title Elephant and his boy companion drifting to an island where they are caught between a conflict between two larger islands. And this film was created and directed by, guess who, Takashi Yanase. Little Jumbo was a success, and this prompted Sanrio to ask Yanase if he could come up with a character for Sanrio's true film debut. Released two months before the film, thanks to Suji's promotional savvy, Yanase's book Chiren no Suzu introduced the world to the lamb and had exactly the same dark plot as the film, all of which was done in the blunt, easy to understand prose of a children's book. We'll get into the why and how later when we're discussing the story, but two months later, the movie based off of Yanase's book was released into theaters as a double feature, it being accompanied by another Sanrio produced film, The Mouse and His Child. The only difference being that Mouse was longer and produced entirely by an outsourced American staff at Wolf Murakami Studio. And while technically more upbeat than Ringing Bell, it still doesn't shy away from heavier topics. Oh, they Ralphie, my boy. He's spare parts. No, no, I'll work. I won't complain. Honest, I'll... No, no, no. Uh, uh, please, no! Oh, no! Jeez, the 70s. There's no exact numbers for Ringing Bell's success, but it was at least a modest hit considering that Sanrio would keep producing animated films, including the other sad children's anime film about a poor tiny creature that we've already covered on this show. Ringing Bell was not just another Sanrio film. It might have actually been THE Sanrio film. Not just as a means to push storybooks and other merchandise, and yes there was cheer and swag, but also the basis for future Sanrio features in terms of direction and animation. Shintaro Suji, despite his position as an executive, truly believed that the animators and directors were the real stars of an animated movie, and should be uplifted as such to ensure a quality product. This is why he put Yanase in charge of Little Jumbo as Suji trusted him the most. But for Ringing Bell, Yanase only did the story and the songwriting for the tragic folk songs that play throughout the film. The real brain behind Ringing Bell is director Masami Hata. Born in Taipei, Taiwan during the Japanese occupation on November 5th, 1942, Hata always had dreams of becoming an artist. But he ended up dropping out to pursue a career in animation and take a big risk with joining a brand new studio called Tokyo Movie Shinsha. There he worked on their first project, a TV adaptation of Osamu Tezuka's Big X. Apparently his work was so impressive that he got the attention of Tezuka and was offered a chance to transfer over to his studio Mushipro. Hata accepted, and that allowed him to be promoted from animator to episode director. He directed and wrote scripts for episodes of Wonder 3, Princess Knight, and Tomorrow's Joe. He also did work on Tezuka's incredibly ambitious and ill-fated anime Rama trilogy. Somehow, he made his way to Sanrio's new animation division and ended up co-directing Little Jumbo with Yanase. And it was his talent for storyboarding that got him the director's seat for Ringing Bell. And he's a significant part of why the film is so effective visually. Hada and his team work to create something that harkens back to the Disney shorts of old, which Suji encouraged. Hada's boarding is one that showcases nature in all its grandeur and its harshness. It can be both beautiful, pastoral panoramas, as well as jagged, unforgiving environments, tying into the theme of nature's duality. Hada also deserves credit for making Ringing Bell a very vicious film while also not spilling a drop of blood. As harsh as the scene is, it still technically falls into the G rating.
It's violent, but not gruesome. But going back to that Disney comparison, Suji really wanted Sanrio to imitate that whole model of animation, right down to assigning animators to do specific characters over specific cuts like how it's usually done in the anime industry. I don't know whether or not this model was used for Ringing Bell, but the short list of key animators did an amazing job with the character animation, one of whom was Toshio Hirata, whom we've talked numerous times on the show, who is said to have done a lot of young Shirin's animation. Shirin's character animation in general is very much in the nine old men mold of squash and stretch expressiveness. It reflects a childlike innocence in the beginning, and is even used well to convey drama when Chirin discovers his mother is dead and his reaction is one of primal sadness. <laughs> and that animation involves with the story. The more Chirin grows older and trains with woe, the more his animation loses its soft squishiness and turns sharper and more brutal. A detail we can credit to other key animator Sadao Miyamoto, who animated most of the action scenes for this film. Voice acting is also a factor that sells you on the film's pathos. Minori Matsuhima, best known for playing the title character in the shoujo classic Candy Candy, plays young Chirin, giving a performance that embodies an innocent shattered, a child clearly struggling to grasp his mother's sudden death. <laughs> Taiko Nakanishi plays Chirin's mother. Her voice is very tender and loving like how the ideal mother should sound, which elevates the tragedy of her sacrificing her life to save Chirin. <laughs> Playing adult Chirin is Akira Kamiya, portraying him as cold and harsh, but still having that vulnerability to him that comes out when the moment is right. Appropriate being that Kamiya's best known role was motherfucking Kinshiro. See, that Fist of the North Star reference wasn't just for show. <laughs> And Seizo Kato, an actor and voice actor who specializes in deep voice villains, plays Woe. Knowing his background, he could have played the villainous role up a lot more, but Kato finds that happy medium where he's clearly a dark force in Chirin's life, but has a voice more like a stern old martial arts master. The kind of voice that you can understand why Chirin found a father figure in him. <laughs> The English dub, though, is historically unique, as it was recorded shortly alongside the original Japanese. This was due to Shintaro Suji's wanting Sanrio's movies to get more international releases, and Ringing Bell was no exception. Ironically, the film did find itself banned in certain countries for its violent content. Oops. My opinions of the dub is that it's totally serviceable, especially with how the voice actors were given directions to try to match the line readings of the original Japanese as much as possible. But it still has certain choices that reek of Saturday morning cartoon thinking. Like, Woe's character is pretty straightforward, we don't need to give him a voice filter. What's a runt like you bothering me for? Two actors I want to highlight. The first being Barbara Goodson, who channels similar energy to Matsuhima's performance. Probably the reason why she got invited back on future Sanrio movie dubs. Look, how does this sound? If things don't work out, feel free to go ahead and eat me. No hard feelings. And Greg Berger as adult Chirin, whom I only want to bring up because that's Corn Fed Pig playing the adult Ram. One of the voice actors from Duckman was in an anime. That's wild to me. Would it be forward to tell you that your voice is of the sirens, your breath is of the lilacs, and your skin is of the soft downy wool of a newborn lamb? Yes, it would. What if I told you you had a great rack? So from its history, to its animation direction, to its voice actors' incredibly poignant performances, I'm sure that's enough to convince you, the audience, that Ringing Bell is working as design, right? But I have a feeling that in order to really convince you, we gotta go deeper.
So what is the central conflict of Ringing Bell? Obviously, it is Chirin versus Wo, the wolf. Chirin wants revenge on Wo for killing his mother, and that is the reason why he wants to train with Wo in the first place, so that he can get stronger and be able to personally be the one to kill him. That's the crux of the narrative, right? Nope, not at all. Even if you ignore the fact that Chirin eventually grows fond of Wo and Wo in kind, the main conflict is not between the two of them. Rather, it's between Chirin and what Wo the Wolf represents. Ringing Bell is a classic conflict of man versus nature, or sheep versus nature in this case. Chirin is not just fighting against Wo, but the entire forces of nature that designates him as prey just waiting to be eaten. <laughs> In the beginning, Chirin might have had a more adventurous and rambunctious soul compared to the other lambs, but he ultimately obeys his mother when she tells him not to venture out past the fence. If he had, and his mother got killed defending him, then his feelings would be one of guilt for having disobeyed his mother's orders leading to her death. But instead, woe comes to them when they are supposed to be safe inside their barn. Chirin's mother just so happens to be one of Woe's unlucky victims. This is what causes Chirin to not only spiral down into sadness, but in rage against the world. He and his mother did everything they were supposed to do as sheep. How dare the forces of nature and predation take her from him when she did nothing wrong? Why is it that, in order to be a good sheep, Chirin might have to die so that another creature can eat? <laughs> But here's another layer to that sweet cake. We see Wo attack, fight, and kill other animals, both prey and larger predators alike, but we never see him eat them. Sure, he may talk about eating prey. <laughs> But we never see him eat meat. And I'm sure this might be because of Sanrio's want to maintain a G rating, but it actually does create a scenario where Wo kills less for survival and more because it's in his nature. To him, he just sees the act of killing as something he has to do because that's just his place in nature. It's his job. <laughs> Wo was imparting this harsh lesson to Chirin, and by extension the audience of children. In nature, one's sustenance may depend on another's demise. It's all part of the great circle of life. Dad, don't we eat the antelope? Although, Wo's belief is one of, the strong must devour the weak. And that's a very loaded phrase for good reason. The world belongs to the strong. And the brutal. And to the brutal. The rabbit is a coward and deserves to die. They spit on the rabbit. Nice kids. But Ringing Bell is not fascist. Let's get that out of the way real quick. Wo may be right in asserting the unglamorous facts of life that all life is cheap in the face of nature. And he includes himself in that equation. Wo's belief that the strong must prey on the weak is rooted in a very nihilistic attitude he has. To him, it is just the way the world works. This is why an important facet in his belief system is that, one day, someone even stronger will come and kill him. And he is okay with that. In fact, it's implied that the reason why Wo takes on Chirin as a student in the first place is because he thinks he might have it in him to be his killer. In the book, he takes Chirin in no questions asked, partially for this reason, and also because of the loneliness of being at the top of the food chain. In the movie though, he's pretty disinterested in taking on a pupil, let alone a sheep pupil. For a solid 10 minutes, he's trying to shoo Chirin away, and at the very least let him down gently by saying that, as a sheep, he cannot be a wolf like him. But that just only motivates Chirin more to become his pupil. And once Wo sees Chirin confronted by another example of nature's casual cruelty, he takes pity on the poor lamb and offers to teach him how to avoid his fate and become a wolf, and maybe even a better wolf than him. Which Chirin ultimately does, killing Wo just like he and Wo always wanted. <laughs> 
こんなふうにしてどこかで野垂れ死にすると思っていたぜしかし俺をやったのがお前でよかった And this part of the film is where the true central theme emerges. If the movie really was just about the law of nature and how the strong must devour the weak, it would focus more on Shiran being locked away from his former sheep brethren, emphasizing it as punishment for going against the course of nature and ending it with Shiran cursing his fate that he can never go back to being a sheep. But it doesn't end like that. Sure, Shiran is upset that the path to going back to being a sheep is forever shut out for him. But that's not what he mourns in the final scene. When he goes back to the mountains, he mourns the fact that he killed Wo. He mourns finally getting his revenge for his mother's death. He got what he wanted, and all it took was to kill the wolf whom he saw as his father. Because the point of Ringing Bell is to impart this lesson to children. Yes, nature is cruel. Yes, one's happiness may depend on another suffering. Yes, there is always going to be predator and prey rule. But in spite of all of that, life is still precious. When Chirin started his descent, it was because he was enraged that the world was unfair enough to kill his mother who had done nothing wrong. But through that journey of his, he had found another life that he realized too late had the same value as his mother's, one that perished at his own hooves. The life of his mother and the life of her killer turned out to be more equal than Chirin had thought. He became a killer to avoid being killed, and all that got him in the end was spending the rest of his life completely and totally alone. I understand why people are tempted to call Ringing Bell a darker, edgier Bambi. In Bambi, his mother's death is traumatizing to him, but he knows he has to move forward as a part of life. In Ringing Bell, Chirin never gets over his mother's death. He is completely consumed by the trauma of it that it sends him down a murderous path of wrath. But you do understand why it's so much more than that, right? With such gorgeous direction, acting, and storytelling on display, Ringing Bell is more than just a shock film to strike childhood trauma in the hearts of the kiddies. It's a tragedy that imparts a very necessary lesson, one that kids of a certain age will have to know sooner or later. Takashi Yanase died of heart failure on October 13th, 2013, though he had been in poor health for years up to that point. He had even joked about it in his final interviews, saying that he was due for the grave in at least another week. It was a sense of humor to show that he knew death was a part of life, and he had long since accepted his own. But his book, and by extension, the movie based off that book, shows us that even in the face of the inevitability of death, we still need to value the living. Life is a very valuable, fragile treasure, and only a lucky few like Yanase could ever live it to its fullest. And to understand that is to understand the beauty and tragedy of the sad story about the sheep who became a wolf. Keep going.